Da, dar dimineața, dimineața, ieri am experimentat, v-am văzut cum funcționează <laughs> și dimineața am zis să am merget de la sine, dar da, n-a fost da. așa. Mai ales la ora asta, probabil, și elevii care i-au salvat, câte ani, dacă, de, de, de pe din săptămâni, elevii au trebuit la salvat de la sine, dar ce e foarte bine. Dar asta explică că mulți, dacă înainte să se mergeau cu bicicleta, mai ei au și trampaie. Da, nu, problema cred că e în meteorologia care am văzut. Da, și până astfel am aflat. Dar și acum, că e în trampaie, nu, că ei cu bicicleta le-au mandat, am avut un spectacol care era pe tare.
So very welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to have you for this quite exciting conference. We will have a session this morning, a first session uh, about evolution of sustainability, sustainability measures and ind indicators, uh, a quite uh, uh, challenging topic uh, that, that implies uh, I would say, uh, as, a, as a person that is not specialized in this field, uh, in, in, uh, about uh, economic engineering, I will see if I, if I will be right. So I will present the, the speakers. We will first have Yona Dunyo. She's associate professor at uh, the research center of the Beta. She will represent two other uh, speakers that will not be here today, François Marmier, Associate Professor at eCube CSIP, and Nathalie Picard, Professor in Economics at the S Research Center Better also. So the, her topic will be sustainability concepts, methods, and measurement over time and disciplines. I think we, we will begin immediately. Just uh, for, the, for the organization, we will uh, have questions immediately after her speech. So um, if you, uh, you can prepare some questions uh, in, in about 20 minutes. So you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So my name is Joanna Dunio. I will present our paper. Uh, named the sustainable, sustainability concepts, methods, and measurement over time and disciplines. I'm, I, uh, it paper, uh, this paper was written with, uh, uh, as my colleague said, uh, Nathalie Picard and Francois Marmier. 
In this uh, presentation, after the state of the art, I will present our methodology, then different models and their illustration, and finally, perspectives and future research. <coughs> the concept of the sustainability was stressed by the NGO Club of Rome in 1968. According to Brundtland report, sustainability refers to a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. Following Eclington, we consider three pillars here. Uh, three pillars of sustainable de development, namely economic prosperity, environmental quality, and social justice. In a, in a previous work done uh, by Winter and Al in 2018, we split societal um, pillar in two parts, as we can see here, work and ethics. More, recent, uh, more, more recently, in Dunio et al. 2021, we have also proposed a customized methodology and a tool to help managers to design and to pilot a strategy of transformation towards 4.0. This uh, methodology includes the essential axis of the sustainable supply chain presented in this picture. Yeah. And uh, this methodology allows to evaluate the performance level of a company and to understand the gap of pro progress between the initial situation here in blue and the target situation here in red. Also, it allows us to consider future areas of improvement. Despite a deliberate will to include environmental concerns in economic calculation in order to internalize environmental externalities, there exists no consensus or universal measurement methodology, and the existing me methods usually exclude the societal pillar de facto. So we aim to fill to <coughs> filling these gaps by building a general model to analyze the different incentive effects, to explain also why some companies decide to adopt a sustainable behavior and others not, and to analyze their respective reactions to public policies <coughs> aimed at promoting sustainable behavior. At the beginning of our study, we have ident identified three groups of agents involved in sustainability adoption. The first group is composed by the firms that are mainly concerned by their own profitability. Second group, individu individuals, may or may not feel concerned by sustainability, which may compete with the, their own economic survival and well-being. And the third group, public authorities, they are in charge of informing firms and households and of inducing them toward a sustainable behavior through policy measurement, norm, norms, and regulation. In this paper, we focus on firms and interac interaction with state. So our objectives are to propose a methodology to integrate the three pillars in sustainable supply chain management and to analyze the best methods to internalize and uh, to internalize the, the externalities related to the three pillars. We will <coughs> thus elaborate an objective function for public authorities combining the three pillars and analyze the incentive which may induce firms 
to internalize their environmental, societal, and economic externalities. <coughs> Those objectives are illustrated on a very simple example, a laundry which can produce a unique service using a mix of two inputs. The first input is an organic washing powder in quantity X1 and price Pi1, and the other input is the traditional washing powder in quantity X2 and price Pi2. <coughs> <coughs> so in our basic model, we consider only economic <coughs> pillar. We have made the fo following assumptions. Assumption one, we consider the organic washing powder is more expensive than non-organic washing powder. The two inputs are pe perfect substitutes. That means the quantity produced only depends on the total quantity of inputs. Production function F is uh, increasing in the total quantity of inputs and is concave. There is a decreasing return to scale. The production is sold to the price P. Input one generates no externality, while input two generates negative externality G, which corresponds to an increasing and convex cost minus G for the society at the all. The marginal productivity at origin, it's larger than the ratio of input to output price. That means marginal benefit, it's larger than marginal cost for each input at the origin. So for the first unit of input used. For a purely economic point of view, without taxation, at last some production would be worth with either input. The profit in the basi basic model here <coughs> is the value of production minus the cost of inputs. So the solution of the basic model in, uh, is that the firm used only the non-organic uh, so the non-sustainable input X2, okay? And the solution of the basic model, the optimal quantity of the input X2 here, uh, is decreasing, is, is a decreasing function of the ratio of prices. The second model takes into account the case of a more or less sustainable firm. In this case, we consider sigma, we consider sigma the firm's degree of sustainability concern. The sustainability, the sustainable profit is then the value here, the value of the production minus the, uh, the cost of the inputs plus a fraction sigma of the negative externalities generated generated by the non-sustainable inputs. We can see here in the illustration the two inputs. This is I input one, so organic washing powder. The input do two, non-organic washing powder. At the optimum, the total uh, quantity uh, of inputs, x1 plus x2, is constant for sigma above this, uh, this threshold. Oh. Oh, yeah. Above this threshold here. Okay. <coughs> then we have the production function, the financial profit, the <coughs> and uh, for the objective function, we uh, calculate the difference between the financial profit and the fraction of the cost of externality that is internalized. The externality cost function here in red is decreasing when the quantity of non-organic washing powder here is decreased. 
and became zero when the here it became zero when only organic powder is used. So in the sustainable context, under assumptions one, one to five, below the threshold sigma one here, okay, in this area, an increase of sigma induced the quantity of non-sustainable input used, the negative externality generated by production, the quantity produced, and also the profit of the firm. Okay. Above a sec the second threshold, sigma two, down here in the third uh, zone, only sustainable input is used here. Okay. And between the two thresholds in the middle, an increase of sigma induce a, a substitution from non-sustainable to sustainable input without affecting production level and reduce both profit and externality generated. So, okay, yeah. If the government consider exactly the same uh, externality function G as the sustainability, sustainability conscious, conscious firms and tax this externality at the rate to sustainability conscious firms will probably reduce accordingly sigma to sigma prime smaller than sigma. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in this case, the objective function became this one, where he taken take into consideration the sigma prime. In the limit case, they will exactly compensate uh, um, so that sigma prime will be equal to maximum between zero and tau. And the firms with sigma larger than tau will not change their behavior because, the, uh, because those firms pursue the same objective as with tau equal to zero. So only their financial profit will be reduced. Taxi taxation induced firms with sigma smaller than tau to behave <coughs> like firms with sigma equal to tau. If, <coughs> if the government consider a different externality function, for example, uh, fa favors the ethic pillar when the firms consider the environmental pillar, taxing one externality may induce firms to substitute the input generating tax for another input generating different externality. In conclusion, we have developed a global model for evaluating public policies only a very simple uh, specific case was presented here, but the method is far uh, more general and may be used uh, to evaluate and compare different policies which affect different uh, the firms depending on their sustainability concern. In the future, we will develop a questionnaire and a database to quantify their spontane spontaneously sustainable attitude of companies and the evolution of a company over time if we ma manage to keep a panel of companies that we interview every year. All this using econometric study. We will also try to extend the model to include equilibrium aspects such as competition between firms, endogenous prices, or firms' entry in the market. Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready for uh, your uh, questions. Uh, thank you very much, Iona. This was uh, quite interesting uh, presentation. 
about what has to be integrated uh, in, 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 in the calculation mm -hmm. of susten sustainability. Let me begin with the first question. Uh, I have, uh, 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 you, you mentioned ethics uh, within the social pillar, mm -hmm. and then you, you mentioned questionnaires. Do you ask questions about ethics to the companies yes. also? Uh, in fact, this study was done uh, during a PhD, one of my PhD stud st students. She was working in Kunanagal company and uh, she was in charge to, uh, uh, to uh, put some uh, sustainable uh, KPIs in this company. And uh, so during this uh, the three years of PhD, she uh, she uh, realized the questionnaire and interviews with different uh, uh, participants in the supply chain of this company. We mm. have studied different supply chains, in fact, in different sectors. And how do you integrate this, how this, it's an externality, how it, it can be internalized? Ethics, I, uh, <laughs> I, I cannot see how it can appreciate it concretely. Yes, it, we, 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 we have discussed uh, in this part uh, how to integrate sustainable concern. Of course, for the instant, we, on, we only put this sigma uh, mm. meaning, uh, but with, oh, hold on, with the, the assumption that the company and the, the regulation of the state used the same uh, externality, negative externality. Mm -hmm. But we, we don't uh, explore more than that uh, to put every KPIs in this mm. indicator. Okay. Yeah, it will be future work. Yeah, thank <laughs> you, very exciting, yes, future work. So uh, I, I give the floor to, to the public. Do you have questions? Yes. Perhaps you can sp activate uh, your microphone and speak yeah. into the microphone. <laughs> I would have a question on the sigma um, sigma component. Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess that this sigma component is the real problem because it's real, really difficult to know from uh, the public deciders. So my question is, finally, according to your model, it seems that uh, the taxation is one of the main solution to reveal <laughs> more or less this sigma. Um, are you going to, to think about other ways of doing, integrating non-monetary non incentives that can, uh, that, can, that can increase as well mm. this sustainable behavior of firms? Yes, you are right. Uh, of course, uh, we, we need to think about <coughs> this uh, also uh, for the instant is just the beginning of our work in this uh, in this side uh, and uh, for sure we need to to think not only to to the financial incentive but also about other uh, other incentives in our model thank you <laughs> other questions okay you're welcome um <coughs> My question actually deals with one of your um, early uh, uh, formulations in your presentation, mm -hmm. uh, saying that getting consensus on measurement te uh, methodologies mm -hmm. is a kind of uh, historical concern. So take the GDP. I'm not sure how exactly it became uh, generally accepted, but it's there. Everybody complains about it, but with what we com complement GDP, that remains a kind of, uh, of a challenge. So do you have a, uh, not a recipe, but uh, maybe a, a kind of a feeling, uh, what makes a methodology come through and gets consensus so uh, one can use it in such a way that there is, as I will s say in my presentation, no escapes. Mm -hmm. So everybody is measured by the same instrument. Yes. As long as we don't do that, yeah. uh, the diversity of methodology is such mm. that um, 
we are having a festival of measurements, but there is no final uh, uh, result in terms of sustainability or other societal yeah. uh, concerns. Yeah. Yes, you are right. Uh, during we had this problem during this PhD I mentioned before, because uh, we we have find a really different measurement of the sustainability, and for the instance, they are not a consensus. That's that's the problem. So how we can find a consensus? This is your question. <laughs> I don't really know. Maybe uh, by regulation, by norms, and. Uh, deciding uh, uh, what are the KPIs we will use everywhere. Because, uh, for example, in this PhD, every, uh, uh, at the beginning, everybody used only carbon calculation. So we, at the, uh, at the beginning of this PhD, we have uh, mentioned that it's insufficient. So we proposed more in the KPIs, by, but uh, it's only for this company, and we cannot force anybody to use it. Mm. So I, 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 I don't have the question. It's very open. <laughs> yes, the response of, of a jurist, uh, you have to convince the, the legislator or the, 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 um, the domestic legislator or the European le legislator to adopt your methods. Yeah. But <laughs> this needs also s a, some kind of consensus before yeah. a political consensus. For sure. Do you have other questions? No more questions? In this case, uh, we will continue with, th with the next speaker. It's an enormous pleasure for me to present Johan Negrutiu, he is emeritus professor, founder of the Michel Serre Institute, and he comes from Lyon. So you have the floor. The, the topic is the landscape of environmental evaluation methods measuring what counts. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, having taken the um, efforts to get me here as a, as a, as a uh, uh, speaker to this uh, meeting where I'm discovering uh, what the uh, east side of France is actually doing, which is uh, impressively interesting. So I will start and end up by almost cheating all over my uh, presentation because I changed a bit the title and I did it last night because of the discussions yesterday and uh, that relates a lot with the question I just uh, asked uh, Joanna because what I'm going to talk about first is the landscape within which environmental evaluation methodology are trying to, uh, to, to become reality. And that landscape is extremely uh, diverse, even volatile. So this, I think, is necessary because at the very end, my point with the landscape in general and with the uh, environmental evaluation methodologies in particular is whether we are able to measure what counts and ruling what matters. So that tells you that the uh, authors of this uh, communication uh, living at the uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon within the uh, Complex System Institute where the Michel Serra Institute itself is uh, located, we are actually a bunch of people uh, who have decided more than a decade ago to make an alliance between uh, life sciences, between judicial studies and uh, uh, modeling capacities. So bring together 
life sciences, uh, legal studies, and uh, big data. And that's roughly what I am supposed to tell you about. Now, to make things uh, measure what counts and ruling what matters, the main problem, I guess, if that's a problem, I'm not sure, but the main concern is the fact that we have difficulties in finding consensus. And this is at all levels of uh, interaction and decision making. And the more society seems to speed up, the more or the slower it becomes. So let's take the, the very big picture. And from there, I will, I will focus down to the environmental uh, method, uh, me uh, evaluation methodologies. That will allow you to see where they are placed exactly in this panorama. So we are at a point where Anthropocene is a kind of uh, cognitive background in our, in our societies. Actually, there are several Anthropocenes in our uh, societies and cultures. And their epistemologies, when you try to frame them, they show that uh, a number of authors, most philosophers, but policymakers also, uh, legal science people, are presenting a series of narratives or of visions um, in which um, the long view is supposed to prevail and uh, in which the narrative is considered as a kind of social trigger. As long, so people, let me put it differently, people understand things, but before they act, they need to believe in, in them. So a narrative makes the job. So what narrative, what these narratives are actually talking about? Well, they are talking about the man-nature relationship. And they can all be hosted in a research field that now is pretty well recognized, and that's socio-ecological systems. So be it Michel Serre's um, natural contract, and the, long, the, the list is very long, or uh, to, to go into the legal dimensions, uh, uh, Mireille Marti del Mas, Compass or to the vision that's presented by the Democratic Party in the United States with the Green Deal. All these narratives are actually presenting, are all socio-ecological systems. In there you can find values, and the question is which of them will be accepted by the society. Now, the choice is not that difficult because uh, as I said, all are talking about uh, socio-ecological uh, configurations, but because everybody gives a different name to their narrative, people have the impression that that's a kind of a jungle of, uh, of possibilities out there. There are not that much, actually. At the other side of the spectrum, you have propositions and initiatives in the society. They are trying to present concrete solutions to our problems. Take one example, the 66 list of uh, propositions by Berger Hulot. But nobody spent time in trying to get a kind of synthesis. The question is, do we actually need a synthesis? If we want to come up with a compromise, with a consensus, I think we do. Now, if this is the case, then socio-ecological transition should have a narrative in which you have a strategy that is associated with a pretty well structured methodology and I insist on the methodological dimension because that's where science comes in and presents instruments to turn it into real life activities. So we are sitting with many framing uh, narratives, we are sitting with laundry lists of propositions and initiatives but there is no kind of compass in between to see, to define where we can go, where we want to go and actually where we can go. So I dare present you 
of kind of a compass that engages only us, the people in, in the Michel Serre Institute, but it's worth discussing. Um, it will take me a bit of time to explain this, but uh, if you are patient, we'll um, get going through. The two sets of circles here are the socio-ecological system. This one is more or less the natural com com component of the system, and it takes you into the planetary health uh, doctrine. That's a Rockefeller Foundation, the Lancet uh, Journal uh, initiative, where the message is you need a safe, sane environment in which healthy societies can function and where healthy people can live. And that must happen, and I think I don't have to insist, discussions were in the same direction yesterday. You need to have this order, environment, science, people. So that's, that's a way to put uh, a health-related narrative into a kind of very tight methodological um, uh, system where we borrow to the public medicine, uh, the, 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 proceed the experimental and the uh, real life procedure of measuring that health. And we have, and I will show what methods we have to measure the health of the environment, the health of society, and the health of people. Now what happens more on the side of the uh, human societies, and that's the second circle. And these are the planetary boundaries. Fortunately, yesterday there was a lot of discussion about them. And uh, although I will go back to, to it into the uh, uh, following, uh, uh, some of the following slides, what you see here is that we try to put a bit of order in these individual uh, boundaries, despite the fact that people are uh, considering that they are interdependent. Now, how in the interdependent are they? If you follow the dotted line in the middle, actually you can separate the nine boundaries into two subsystems. One is food systems, agriculture, and the other is the global pollution. Now, if you say that, then you can turn planetary boundaries, which I don't think it's a very useful decision-making instrument, but I think it's a very useful pedagogic instrument. Now, if you aggregate the things as we did, then we can define priorities. Now, what are the priorities today? If we follow the planetary boundary system and the aggregation we did, then priorities today is food systems, and global pollution. Interesting enough, for food systems, that means from field to fork, we know what the solutions are. We could turn, switch overnight into a sustainable society. For global pollution, we don't. We don't because, to make it short, we can discuss it uh, afterwards, uh, the problem of science in front of the global pollution is that we have what's called the um, um, uh, come on uh, the cocktail effect. How many chemical compounds are humans delivering in na in the nature these days? We have an idea. The lowest approximation is 150,000 different molecules that nature has never generated. Now make a cocktail of these uh, molecules and then you see why science cannot decide with the available methodologies on more than a cocktail composed of five molecules. Five molecules. So science has no solution for global pollution. 
And that's our big threat. Why defining these two priorities, I have also the opportunity, because in those uh, boundaries you have climate change and biodiversity. If those boundaries make sense, then we have, and these two families are the ones that actually dominate the priority agenda, then climate change as a problematic situation for our uh, situ uh, societies and biodiversity, a problematic problem for our societies, they are second range priorities. Because each of them, both of them, are both included in food systems and global pollution. So as long as we do not address food systems and global pollution, whatever we do about climate change or biodiversity uh, restoration, it will be a waste of resources and human capacities. So the right order of doing so is what I'm trying to say in the three triangles here. In the food systems, you have three type of resources that are crucial. Soil, water, biomass. These are primary resources on which food, uh, construction, uh, and other commodities depend on. And that th the interesting thing about them is that they are essentially renewable, but exhaustible. They are non-substituable, non non-substituable, and there are non delocatable. So that makes them a strong uh, family of primary resources. Now, how do we go to get planetary health and planetary boundaries in a kind of a compass for our societies? This is suggested by the last two triangles here. To do that, I think we need methodologies and instruments that will work on the short and the long term. The methodology and instruments I'm talking about is to make uh, inventories and uh, diagnoses of global resources and of planetary health. Global resources that are bound to food systems, but not only. All what is considered resource is a kind of uh, uh, concern about the methodology I'm talking you about. Why? Because resources, and again, despite our concern about climate change and biodiversity, but the resources is the thing that makes our societies run. Historically speaking, there is only the resource battle, the geopolitics of resources, that makes our societies run around the clock. Why? Because we are resource center and health concern and many of those resources concern health right now saying this where should priorities go now in terms of societal action and this is the last triangle that's presented here should go in making that accessible resources can be used under the responsibility of all the society uh, and the society at large to cover the needs, the fundamental needs of population. When you say this, there is a lot of legal normative uh, standard uh, com um, components in there and there is also an important dimension on what are the essential needs in our societies. So that when you come at the end of the day, make sure that when you cover those needs, planetary health is there and the planetary boundaries are included in those calculations. So the solutions to go to that uh, uh, kind of conclusion where legal studies have a particular important role to play is that either and the minimal, minimal uh, compromise of our society should be in uh, enacting a universal social protection floor or to go more deeply into it is to make sure that 
the methodology and the instruments we develop in measuring resources and planetary health become uh, constraining, politically, economically, socially. Now, in those resources, planetary health methodologies and toolbox, I can register the subject of my original talk, environmental evaluation. That's what I'm going to do next. Now, to do that, we have to get acquainted with a number of uh, concepts that are uh, running around the cloud today. Now, critical zone. Has anybody uh, heard about the critical zone? Actually, critical zone takes us essentially to the uh, primary resources I was talking about, because the critical zone is the epidermis of the bios is the biosphere, the epidermis of the uh, Earth system, where atmosphere, hydrosphere, lithosphere, soils, and living system spheres are connected. That's the critical zone. Now in that zone, the essential ones for agriculture and for our societies, I'm not neglecting the air, but it's soil, water, biomass. And soil, water, biomass, as I will show in the next few slides, is actually the engine of the power system that are running our societies today. That means food and agriculture, the basic uh, needs of our of our societies is based on soil water biomass is based on information that we collect now on soil water biomass so the data systems and the legal environment in which these constitute the uh, components of the power systems planetary boundaries this one <coughs> I told you you know it so I will not insist except that if you take the part I, I was given to agriculture, you find in there water, soil, biomass again. Now, if you go to the aggregation I was talking about, is that was not clear in the previous slide, is that according to the uh, middle dotted line that separates the camembert into these two families, agro deregulation and chemical, physical chemical deregulation, that's where you see that these together, when they are going wild, they are generating a global health bubble. Global health bubble. That's why these boundaries connect very tightly to the planetary health system I was talking about. Now, people who are talking about planetary boundaries, and in particular the right half of the, pre of, of the diagram, they are very approximative about those uh, uh, entities, pollution, stratospheric ozone, atmospheric. So you see there, the boundary system is very, uh, is, is, is not scientifically uh, well established. It's not surprising because as I said, we have no solution on the science side to deal with the global pollution. And that's a challenge for science. And that's a challenge for society. Now take the Green Deal of the Europe. What they say for 2050, zero pollution. It's, it's, an, it's, it's a political nightmare. Nobody can say that. Nobody can say that, but they say it. Now you have the REACH program, which tries to define a bit of order and discipline in this thing. But we are far from knowing how to go to zero pollution. So that's a challenge. Insisting on land use change, because in the triangle land, water, biomass, land change is, a, is an extremely important uh, dimension, as I will show in the um, environmental evaluation methodology. Now, if you take land, cha land use change since the uh, 18th century, what you see there, and I will not insist too much, but the dark green sector tells you the amount of the ecosystem that have been strongly anthropized by humans. This shows that we are reaching, oops, this shows that we are reaching a, a moment these days where half of the planet is strongly anthropized, anthropized and that's where linear events will turn into a sigmoid 
that means turn into state shifts. Now, legal studies, instead of talking about urgency, should include the state shift situations, where a system goes from predictable or relatively predictable situations into unpredictable and irreversible change. That's what a state shift is producing. And land use change is the culprit. Why? Because this is, by doing agriculture, humans have achieved an incredible performance, is making from land use change the largest human geoengineering project. That you can see from satellite, and that is the largest impact we have produced on the genuine planet. And there goes sanitary health and the like. That's geopolitical concern about all this. Land, water, biomass, it's at the center, at the heart of conflict. If you look in detail, what makes running uh, the geopolitics is in green, fossil energy, in yellow, uh, water problems, hydric stress, in pink, food problems and uh, within a green uh, un within a kind of green line uh, system is land grabbing so these are the challenges we are facing today and this is what we need to measure if measuring what counts comes in this is what we should do so coming to my very story huh? I promise to tell you Um, we have established a list of something like 20 criteria. I will not detail them here, but that allowed us to see what the landscape of environmental evaluation is today. Now, I will talk about the first and then the ones in color. The objective and goals of these uh, environmental evaluations actually go from something we can go weak to strong sustainability. Is that the real truth behind that? I'm afraid not really. The real truth behind that is that different objectives and different goals actually have to do with the extent to which we are considering the geopolitical importance of land, water, biomass. That's what makes those methodologies run. I will try to demonstrate this by I'm almost done. Okay. Uh, there are two sets of indicators that are important that are called DPSIR driver pressures state impact response and that's the reference system in indicator definition and then you have indicators that define ecosystem to natural capital dimension now we show this by doing this radar kind of system and align there four categories of evaluation methodologies. Indicators, footprints, land uh, methodologies, ecosystem services, and environmental accounting. Now these radars tells you that most of them are very shy in measuring important dimensions of the environment, except some that are present here in environmental evaluation. And this fits when you go into the DPCA uh, model. Again, uh, showing the same uh, repartition of those methodologies. The reason for which we did a real experiment with an accounting methodology that's called ecosystem natural capital uh, accounting on the Rhone River watershed. And where, and I will finish there, where the advantage of the system is that it uses a GDP, a GDP language, accounting language. It's exhaustive. It starts with land use metrics. It can produce a dashboard of information or a unique measure unit. Doesn't use ecosystem services to measure. I can explain why. 
doesn't use biodiversity measure per se, and I explain you why, but it uses landscape units to measure degradation or improvement. So, to cheat and to finish, I have prepared, I knew I will go beyond the time, I made a poster about the experiment on the Rhone watershed valley, uh, and those interested to see how we calculate and how we dispose uh, cartographically those uh, different situations, I am at your disposal. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I've been long and slow. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it <laughs> Since we are quite well in time still, so no, no problem. Uh, f for me, it, it was a quite uh, exciting presentation. Uh, let me begin perhaps with, uh, with the first question. You mentioned in your introduction that there are, that there are many visions, uh, espe especially by philosophers, lawyers, and so on. And uh, I think you took some of them that you analyzed in, in your presentation. But what about... Uh, uh, ecological approaches, you know, that are not uh, human approached. You spoke a lot of about food problems. Uh, it, it, it was human health. It was very human orientated. What do you think about integrating theories uh, about the intrinsic value of nature? You s do you take into account these factors also? Speaking about uh, socio-ecological systems is actually doing that. But as I said, the methodologies and narratives that go around, they go from monetary value or val valuation to valuing ecosystems intrinsically per se. And this methodology, this, this uh, ecosystem capital ac accounting methodology I'm presenting is actually because it doesn't measure ecosystem services, because it doesn't measure biodiversity per se, it uses a relatively neutral scale, which is the landscape integrity and its socio-economic characteristics. Here we basically did the uh, ecosystem characteristics of those uh, landscape units, is actually measuring uh, ecological value. That means not economic value. So that ecological value is a kind of health measure because it shows how much we impact the ecological potential of that area. When you have those red spots on those maps, tells you that, and they are represented in landscape units, tells you that those areas that have uh, warm colors are in trouble. Yes, so uh, that's why I, I was also suggesting that when uh, those methodologies goes into objectives and the goals and they pretend um, <coughs> doing something between weak and strong sustainability, they're actually trying to, to measure how much of the land, water, biomass, air uh, resources are actually used for business, for economic activities, and how much remains for the society to be considered as eventually uh, uh, common goods. And therefore, I think weak, strong sustainability is a bit shaky. We rather should go to the, this, this kind of uh, proprietarian rights and uh, economic use facilities that uh, human organizations have or do not have to take possession and exploit beyond reason or with reason some of these resources. Thank you very much. Do you have questions? No questions, for instance. Yes? This is on. Yes. Um, that was extraordinarily interesting for an anthropologist. Um, whose department is about to launch a master's program in global and planetary health. So I want to ask you to what extent 
um, in your conversations and dialogues, which are very illuminating. Um, what inputs maybe you're getting from qualitative social science to understand this, this modeling of um, such a grand scale? But also you have your in situ studies, of course. But I'm wondering to what extent you're interested in the qualitative social science of how people might respond to the water, biomass, soil uh, um, relationship in uh, the kind of interesting social movement that I was talking about yesterday, that people are trying to take this kind of agenda on the local patch of turf, as we say in English. <laughs> and make a difference themselves? Uh, not easy, but uh, I, I, I find my way to answer the question. Uh, first answer is that when you do planetary health, and you do it in the order I'm trying to suggest is the right one, social sciences intervene at every step. And in particular, when it's about social health, that means social cohesion, and individual behavior and individual integration to make that social cohesion work. And that's why a minimum uh, requirement to get that planetary health going on those two dimensions is to ensure that politically, uh, globally, we accept that every human being has the right and access to a universal social protection floor. More extensively, where legal studies and social sciences are coming is the discussion about the essentials, the needs, what makes the dignity of a human in terms of what needs it has, not only to access to health and other uh, social protection facilities, but to be able to cover those needs in those two dimensions. Because the uh, access to food is the first primary necessity, despite, despite the discussions, including climate change and biodiversity, around energy transition. The first energy transition we have to ensure is not the thermic transition, because some people around the globe, those who are most hungry, is warm enough, and they don't, don't live in big houses, so they don't need thermic transition. They need metabolic transition, food transition, nutritional transition, having the right to a proper and clean and safe food. So uh, those needs are legitimately under the responsibility of social sciences to decide where they start and where they stop. And that's why I'm talking about responsibility, in which case social sciences, again, they, they <coughs> and legal studies in particular, they should talk certainly about human rights. But once human rights are uh, properly uh, enacted, then we have to go to the other dimension that comes with it, human duties, obligations, and that's responsibility. As long as we only talk about human rights, means that we actually don't cover those human rights. And as long as we don't cover basic human rights, we cannot push people to be responsible and to be, uh, to take into, in, into his hands respons um, duties. But as long as rights and duties do not go together, we are stuck. Thank you very much. So I, I think we, we have to finish with your presentation and I will give the floor to uh, the next speaker. That is Jules Boileau, his PhD candidate S at SCEFE, CNRS. So you will speak about DEMO. Oh, I, uh, you will explain what means yep. MO. Uh, an in innovative vision of urban planning for okay. sustain sustainability okay. from design with nature to design for nature. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, first of all, many thanks for the organization and uh, allowing me to present this. Uh, so we talked a lot about uh, socio-economical, political uh, landscape just before, or uh, sustainable development uh, yesterday. Um, 
I'd like to go back to a more practical approach and to ground level, level landscape. So I'll first introduce myself. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the CNRS and um, uh, Ecological Center in, uh, in Montpellier, as well as the uh, Geographical Center in Montpellier. And I'm also uh, working in the Ecological Consultancy Office Terico, uh, which is uh, working on, uh, on biodiversity uh, integration in the uh, urban, pla urban planning that I'm going to uh, introduce today. So I'll be more focused on the biodiversity side of sustainability, which is, uh, in my opinion, one, uh, one field that is um, hard to measure and therefore uh, less well harder to uh, to um, integrate in the in the um, sustainable development strategies so today i'm going to present you uh, this research project demo which is uh, led by the um, zurich university zo as well as uh, teorico and the uh, chartier d'alix uh, an architectural uh, consultancy office in paris uh, the main goal of uh, the DEMO project is to bring together different fields of expertise, such as landscape planner, urban planner, uh, ecologists, and uh, architects to get to work together at multiple scale, from uh, um, a metropolitan scale to the building scale, really, to bring biodiversity uh, in the, the front of the scene and uh, integrate it in the, in the sustainable strategy. Uh, so I'll first introduce uh, a few things about current practices regarding uh, ecological uh, studies. And uh, I'll then try to present you the different proof of concept that we, uh, we developed to get from the concept of design with nature to the concept of design for nature. So, um, so today, globally, the, the, the biodiversity is integrated in the urban planning through design with nature. That is a concept developed by McHarg in 1976. And is globally the way of um, integrating biodiversity as, uh, or environmental in, uh, in general as uh, development restraint for for urban planning. So uh, the the main objective when we talk about uh, sustainability and the three pillars, environment environment is considered uh, uh, as this kind of development restraint for uh, either economic or social development. So that's how we can see the the current practices of uh, of urban planning. Uh, we talked yesterday about this pillar environment that it should be the, the very baseline of uh, any other strategy or at least should be considered on its own and um, currently uh, the, the, the global way of addressing biodiversity or environment in, uh, in urban planning is, is not this one. Um, I'd like today to talk about the, um, the measure of biodiversity and today uh, in urban planning uh, biodiversity is mainly considered through uh, the study of uh, very specific or very um, sensitive species and is lacking the big picture of what biodiversity is and uh, should be uh, considered. Um, if we go back to uh, the, the, the last report of the EPBS, uh, which is the GIEC for biodiversity, we can, uh, we realize that, well, Everybody is uh, well aware of uh, the current situation and the biodiversity erosion. Uh, but we realize that some drivers are more important than other. Uh, first of all, obviously, uh, the direct predation from mankind to biodiversity, but also the large scale uh, land use change uh, that was mentioned just before through agricultural development, for instance, but also f for, uh, through urban planning and in uh, Western civilization, in France, for instance, uh, urban planning and urban development, economical development, uh, is ve uh, has very strong impact on, uh, on biodiversity. So uh, landscape planner and um, elective representative uh, have um, very strong uh, levers to uh, maintain good levels of biodiversity and to um, change the way we uh, impact it. 
So different goals, different uh, um, uh, objectives has been uh, uh, set up on the international level. Uh, the high key targets for Europe, for instance, or more globally, the, the non at loss goal uh, has been set. It really was, was born in, uh, in 1992, but it appears in, uh, in the regulation, uh, in the European regulation, in the French regulation in, in, in 2016. So it's really an economical point of view. Uh, we are counting for biodiversity as units, either lost or uh, gained. So that opens to uh, the offset mechanism. And the main objective is to balance the equation. So either you lose and gain biodiversity units, either you keep it stable. But that goal is um, really ambitious and uh, is now in the regulation pro protocol in France uh, with the objective of mitiga mitigating and uh, controlling the impact uh, human activities have have on, uh, on biodiversity. So to reach this goal, uh, different uh, dispositives has been developed. For instance, the mitigation hierarchy that uh, states that we have to first avoid, then reduce, and uh, if impact is still existent, offset impact for biodiversity to produce gains. So that's the main idea for uh, measuring and uh, mitigating the impact on biodiversity. We propose to go further than this and to consider biodiversity and environmental, ecological and environmental as, uh, as the pillar is supposed to be in a sustainable development and integrate biodiversity uh, in the systemic reflection of urban planning, planning sorry, <laughs> uh, rather than just uh, or more like any other sector policies like energy, like transportation, health, uh, that are currently uh, considered in the systemic reflection of urban planning. Uh, so to go through this paradigm change, we have to consider conservation strategy for natural heritage that are linked with different um, human objectives and ecosystem services, uh, such as uh, depollution or uh, well-being for, uh, for uh, humans. So the concept design for nature is presented here. Uh, the, well, the main problem and the main issue we have with this concept is to define a proper biodiversity diagnostic. And that's what I'm going to introduce and present real, uh, just later. But the main idea is to learn from the current practices, keep them, but also introduce these ideas of conservation targets and um, and go to uh, a, a design that is uh, well, uh, urban planning that is designed for conservation as well as human development. So the very first step is this idea of measurement and uh, indicators of biodiversity that are at the same level as other indicators uh, that were, for instance, presented just before on um, physical sides of uh, environmental or uh, uh, indicators of uh, sustainability or indicators or of human activities that are well known and well used now. Uh, so biodiversity can be uh, expressed or declined with three uh, different components, according to a uh, uh, NOS presentation in 1990. Either composition, which is the the diversity that we uh, we hear and we talk about a lot, the number of species, the presence of species, the diversity of species on a, on a given area, structure, which is the physical organization of biodiversity, uh, uh, different habitats, uh, quantity, configuration, but also function, which is currently lacking in uh, environmental um, condition assessment, but more globally in the, in the um, biodiversity integration. Function is, is uh, more globally related well, in, uh, in that case of, of application is uh, uh, related to how does biodiversity uh, live, how in which state it is. Uh, it's more like, uh, well, in ecology, we can call it um, uh, meta-community, uh, meta-population functioning. How does uh, species live? Where do they move? Where do they connect? Where do they, uh, what is their behavior on a given space? Once this diagnostic is set, 
prospective scenario and a multi-scale approach can be developed in order to um, be used from urban planning to the very building uh, design. This paradigm uh, change from design with nature to design for nature uh, suppose, well, a few preconditions, uh, very strong adherence of the elected representatives. It has to come with and for them. Uh, a better equipment for the communities and the collectivities for them to understand, know and uh, use their knowledge on, uh, on biodiversity. Uh, and the development of collaboration tools. Uh, ecologists can't and shouldn't do all of the urban planning alone, as well as urban planners shouldn't uh, consider biodiversity without ecologists. So we have different fields of expertise that, well, really don't speak the same language, really don't have the same way of working. So how can we make them collaborate on, on the basis of uh, biodiversity diagnostic to go as far as uh, building design? Um, so I'll present you uh, quickly two cases of study, the Zurich Canton in the DEMO project, uh, which is the, the, main, uh, the main goal of, uh, of my presentation today. It's a um, research project bringing together different fields of expertise, as I presented earlier. The, the goal, uh, the, the um, conceptual goal, uh, the end goal, scientific goal, sorry, is to set a workflow for the multi-scale approach of design uh, for nature and the very ground level goal, the, the practical uh, goal is to um, improve uh, the biodiversity potential of one building in the, in the um, university of uh, the campus university of Zurich. So how do we go from a very global uh, Zurich area approach to benefits very local on one building in the in the the campus of uh, Zoo uh, University and I'll also use uh, the the example of uh, the Nîmes metropolitan area that, that is also uh, that you can consult on the poster above that is a subject of my PhD uh, that is a, a strategy of uh, the application of the mitigation hierarchy at the scale of the metropolitan area to have a much better integration of biodiversity in the urban strategic uh, development program. It's a research and operational project, research um, uh, operational because uh, the, the, the metropolitan services uh, are currently uh, asking for uh, uh, this study on a, on a, uh, uh, with the, the, the ecological consultancy office, there we go. So as I was uh, presenting earlier, the very first step is the ecological diagnostic. How do we measure and how do we integrate biodiversity information uh, in urban planning? So many approaches can be, uh, can be mobilized and um, I don't think that I will spend a lot of time on the technical part uh, here, this might not be the subject. Realize that maybe I should have put much more pictures of biodiversity uh, here, but uh, the main idea is to have information on composition, structure, and function. So the very first step is to have this information on composition. What species are we considering? What is the, the diversity on a given area? And how do we mitigate for those? So here, just quickly, um, for, for uh, Zurich, for the, the DEMO project, we use the species distribution models. Uh, that allow us to uh, infer presence and uh, sorry, presence and semi-absence of uh, different species to know if they should be considered or not, because to to understand if they live or not in the the area. So here you have the example for the the middle brown uh, butterfly, but we use the uh, various data for uh, different uh, different butterflies. So. Once we have these, uh, these first input data, we have the presence and uh, the very baseline for our diagnostic. The second and uh, probably most important part rely on uh, ecological modeling. The idea is to use simulation to understand how does a given species live and exist on a given area. So we use the Simoico modeling tool 
which was developed by uh, Sylvain Moulera in his uh, PhD. Uh, the two from the input of um, land use map and behavior uh, data of a given species will produce maps on either uh, movements, individual movements of uh, each species we simulate, but also on the what we call population viability analysis. Uh, how does the species, um, in what condition, sorry, does the species live on the territory? Uh, are there, is the, the population globally um, dying or is the population globally st stable? At what condition, where, and uh, how, how important? Uh, so these, the aggregation of the different, uh, different modeling approach, different model models for different species, but also all the uh, uh, environmental information, the presence of species, the distribution model, etc., can be aggregated into one map of uh, sensitivity of a given area regarding bio uh, biodiversity uh, issues. So here, here you have a uh, NIM uh, metropolitan area with a uh, heat map of where is the most important area for a given number of species. That's the very, very uh, baseline for our analysis. Once di the diagnostic is set, remains the question of how do we use it? So it can be mobilized in, uh, in, different, um, uh, in different approaches, uh, different, uh, sorry, uh, different regulation uh, standards, but we can also use it in different uh, dispositives like, for instance, the ecological network, the green and blue corridors, for instance, that is um, mobilized all over Europe. Um, but it, this, uh, this dispositive is um, quite permissive regarding different regulation protocols. So we can go further and uh, use that diagnostic to, to uh, to be linked with um, the mitigation hierarchy, for instance, in France, which is uh, in French or, or, or in most Europe, um, is uh, quite entered in the in the regulation protocol. And um, then we can use it for the very first step of urban planning, for instance, uh, identifying different type of area uh, for, for this planning. So as I'm presenting right here, we can set the avoidance area which really will be the, the, the area with the most ecological importance, such as those one here. This is a uh, Mediterranean forest and uh, very, very useful in, uh, in the, the NIM uh, metropolitan area regarding biodiversity function functionment. So we can identify where not to build, but we can also identify preferred development area with low impact potential where Biodiversity is either not present, either, either resilient enough for a uh, change in land use, or either um, already gone from the, that, uh, that different spaces. So that would be a second type of information. And finally, as, um, as the mitigation hierarchy um, offers us to do, offsets potential area, meaning uh, area where uh, the ecological uh, values are pretty low, but can be enhanced with human activities, um, modulo different uncertainties regarding the ecological restoration of, uh, of um, uh, habitats. Finally, um, and that will be the, the main goal in the design for nature, uh, the idea is to develop a conservation strategy regarding, for instance, these three types of area, but a real uh, conservation strategy uh, linked with urban development, but really based on the uh, on targets that should be and, and will be uh, uh, find in the in the future, and um, really uh, anchored in the the um, economical development strategy of uh, the uh, the collectivity. One of the most important part of um, this global process is to include collaborative processes. The main idea is to rely different actors, different expertise on this 
biodiversity diagnostic, but also on the um, consequences this diagnostic is going to have on the urban planning strategy. It's uh, really two, the two goals are uh, are um, to be found in uh, in this collaborative process. The first one is to gather all this expertise to have a better quality, a better information on the the biodiversity diagnostic and also on the eco um, economical development strategy of the area, but also to start creating uh, a movement of uh, different actors uh, that have different issues uh, and strategies with the development uh, of the area and to bring them together to work with the land planner and the land user. Finally, and I don't have much time, but uh, once the global strategy, the large scale strategy, the large scale diagnostic is set up, we can go further and um, try to enhance uh, artifacts and uh, building through biodiversity welcoming. Uh, try to make them more suitable for uh, for different species. Try to enhance the quality of uh, of ecological acceptance of the urban areas. For instance, uh, urban ecology is now growing more and more, and we can um, use more and more um, cities uh, for for habitat as habitats for different species, which will have uh, important consequences for human well-being or human connection with nature. But uh, the main issue here is to, <coughs> well, to use the different results we had just before in the biodiversity diagnostic and to allow different people in different fields of expertise to work together, how to collaborate between fields. And one of our ideas in, uh, in the, the demo project is to simplify this collaborative work by using different um, technologies that allow us to do that, to do so so global information system for instance has been developed in the last 10 years and is now globally used by all the actors regarding uh, environment and uh, urban planning which can be mobilized for uh, a map and uh, and geographical analysis but we can go further and use for instance the uh, building information modeling which is a uh, technology that is already vastly used in the field of construction, in the field of uh, um, landscape planning and landscape development, but that is only used by them. So by integrating biodiversity and environmental uh, physical constraint, all these type of information, all these type of data in the, this already used um, uh, collaborative tools, we can enhance the, the way we collaborate together with multiple fields of expertise and uh, allow more interesting projects to uh, to arise for biodiversity, for instance. And I think I'm out of time. So, so I'll just finish quickly. So uh, I was presenting you the demo project. This is the Zurich Canton area. This is the building we try to enhance regarding biodiversity. So. We developed a diagnostic for biodiversity. We um, identified what type of artifact we want, what type of direction we want to uh, to go for the enhancement of uh, the the, um, sort of the habitats we want to develop on the different building. And finally, architectures, with all this information available for them, are able to present us different strategies, different scenarios for our building evolution. And that'll be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for contributing to to our topic to the topic of, of our conference with urban planning. So, just a, a very short first question: What it, it stands? What does it stand for? Uh, demo. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think it's something like development of modeling approaches. Uh, I think D modeling. And, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> M is, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure to uh, check that <laughs> later. <laughs> Sorry. So, do you have questions for our speaker? So. Thank 
you for putting the uh, uh, urban thinking into the uh, uh, general discussion. I think it's very important to have um, architects implicated in the way cities uh, develop. Uh, while saying this, I will try to combine the ideas I presented below and the ideas you are presenting now. Because at the PhD level you are, it's probably uh, useful to consider um, dimensions that have not been included so far in your presentation. So I have three points. One is biodiversity lives in my triangle, soil, water, biomass. And as long as most of the biodiversity lives there, urban environment is a kind of museistic approach to biodiversity. As long as food systems to feed demography of the planet are what they are, biodiversity as such has poor future. That's one thing. Second, metropolitan, metropolitan areas as urban areas are actually highly fragmented habitats. There is no real space for biodiversity to uh, develop there. It can have a state, but it cannot be something that has a weight in the global biodiversity balance. You can, <laughs> simply because uh, if green cities are better than uh, gray cities, I think the weight of metropolitan areas globally on the planet and where biodiversity is supposed to develop, uh, it doesn't weight sufficiently. Third point, yeah, um, in, in addition, metropolitan areas have been developed by our ancestors on places where water, land, biomass were the best possible to produce food and other commodities. So what we are putting under artificial uh, constraints are those where soil quality, water accessibility and biomass productions, because soils were the, be the most fertile, are actually losing ground. So we have to take that into consideration through the price of real estate. And that's a real problem. And I think judicial dimension is particularly concerned there. Third and last point, if you measure biodiversity, like you said, uh, how, what's the periodicity of that uh, uh, diagnostic? Because if you have to, to take political decision into account, then you have to have a kind of annual, be annual uh, diagnostic capacity. Do you have that? Because if you don't, you will never be able to compare uh, successive electoral uh, uh, governance, and you will not be able to compare different places in the country and outside the country. So some people speak about ordinary biodiversity. Now, what is ordinary biodiversity? That's landscape biodiversity. So that comes back to my comment. What matters for biodiversity is not to fragment landscapes and habitats. And that's a measure you can do everywhere all the time. Satellites can do it. So it's a proxy. OK, so I'll, I'll try to answer a few of your comments. Um, I'm, uh, well, on the very, very last idea, of uh, the impact on, on fragmenta of fragmentation on biodiversity, for instance, um, I would say that it's not that simple. Uh, that's why I, I made a point on um, making a difference between physical structure of uh, landscape, for instance, and functional biodiversity. The, the fragmentation, for instance, has much more impact or much um, harder or intense impact than just the fragmentation physical. You, you can use a proxy that is the landscape measurement 
in order to uh, assess fragmentation. But we realized that we have to go further than that because the proxy is leaving behind much more information, ecolog um, ecological depth that you mentioned, for instance, or the, um, uh, the development of strategies uh, for different species to go further than, than the, the fragmentation. The fragmentation in its own reality is not a threat to biodiversity. It's the very way biodiversity exists. Species uh, are born because and thanks to fragmentation. The same, spe the same population get fragmented and over the centuries and uh, many, many, many years, uh, they became two species different. And that's how you create biodiversity. The main issue with the current fragmentation uh, that is appearing is that it's going real too fast. And so species cannot, can't adapt and it's uh, associate with direct destruction of individuals and population. So that's one of the main problem. And that's why uh, studying of uh, functional biodiversity through modeling, for instance, is much more interesting than uh, it, it's going much further than um, a physical structural uh, analysis. So that's just the first thing. The, your question about the periodicity of the modeling is really, really interesting. And you're, you're totally right. Um, this is the key point. We have to be able to compare and, uh, and um, use uh, these tools to, get to go uh, to uh, analyze future strategies. So yes, it's possible, totally. Uh, the, the, the main idea for these, uh, these tools is that they are, are based on um, land use maps. So if we change the land use map, we can produce prospective scenarios, for instance, or diachronic analysis. And here I didn't present it, but most of the time that's what we do. For instance, when we try to uh, uh, analyze uh, analysis the, the impact, the future impact of a uh, development project, you have to make these scenarios. And that's, I think, really useful for the uh, uh, elected representatives because they can measure and they can understand how much they're going to impact their own environment. So that's it. For uh, for the rest, I I kind of disagree with the, the metropolitan view of uh, an area lacking biodiversity. It really depends on the scale you're considering. If you consider planetary scale, of course, biodiversity will be uh, in the Amazonian forest, will be in the in the ocean. It will not be even well. It will not be in France, for instance. It will hardly be in most of Europe, but I'm not sure that this really makes sense when we're talking about biodiversity. And besides, uh, here, it's well, those were just um, uh, case studies, but I think that we have a responsibility to protect the everyday biodiversity as well as the massive species that we want to we wanna have. And biodiversity lies everywhere, really. Uh, the metropolitan area, it's not only urban area. For instance, uh, Nîmes Metropole. Uh, I just want to go back real quick. But this is a land use here. This is a land use of uh, of Nîmes Metropole, metropolitan area. And uh, obviously, in the very center of uh, the metropolitan, in the city of Nîmes, the uh, biodiversity is highly degraded. Uh, the, the the level of biodiversity there is quite low, but right outside and that's the specificity of uh, european cities for instance and in particular uh, mediterranean cities right outside of the city you have very high level of uh, biodiversity in comparison with local biodiversity of course uh, no comparison with amazonian biodiversity for instance but it really depends on the scale you're considering it besides it really depends also on the um, the metrics that you want to associate with biodiversity, the very definition of biodiversity. Are you considering a list of species, which will be obviously uh, much longer and much more important in tropical areas? Or are you considering interaction, functional diversity? And that will be, uh, well, almost equal all around the globe. I'm, I'm really, oh, sorry. No, that will be it. <laughs> that will be it. Uh, I so totally agree on the well the very specific focus of uh, my position in, uh, as a PhD, for instance, uh, and um, 
now, well, today and right now, I'm still really focused on uh, our small territories and uh, and the small metropolitan area where I work. And uh, I think this kind of work designed for a country level, for instance, would be very different, and uh, the the consequences would be very different for for well the the use. Uh, I'm sorry, I think we run out of time and we can, can perhaps we can continue the discussion during the, the coffee break. So we will finish this first session of the morning on the evolution of sustainability measures and indi indicators. Uh, I, I think we have to, to find a very difficult balance between uh, methods done by us as human beings and uh, the ecological laissez-faire, uh, laissez-aller, and think I think we, we have still to solve this. Uh, th th certainly there is no definite response uh, how solving the balance between laissez-faire of nature and, and human methods for influencing. So perhaps this is my last impression. Have a nice coffee break uh, un until we will, uh, at, at what time we will continue? 10 minutes, so 15 minutes, so we will have a 15 minutes break.